This is the 20... 25? Really? Man, I talk too much. But your friends did warn you about that before you signed up for this class, right? Anyway, this video discusses flip-flops. The previous video demonstrated why CPUs need clocks, and then showed how to incorporate a clock into a latch. But we also saw that a clock latch wasn't sufficient because it was like building a door and then leaving it open 12 hours a day. What we really need is a figurative door that's open just long enough to lock in a new value. There are several ways to build a circuit with this behavior. This video presents an approach called the master-slave flip-flop. The basic idea is to put two D latches back to back, but configured in such a way that they accept new values at opposite times. The idea here is that the potential new values have to go through two doors before affecting any other computations. So I like to draw this analogy. Have you ever been to a zoo where you can go in and pet the animals? The zoo here in Grand Rapids used to have baby goats. To get into the goats, you'd have to go through one door, close it behind you, and then go through a second door. Because both doors were never open at the same time, the goats couldn't escape. So something similar is happening here. So suppose the clock's at one and has been at one for a while. This part about it being at one for a while is important. We'll see that in a minute. The leftmost latch is blocking the input so its state won't change. The rightmost latch is accepting new input, so in theory its state could change, but the left flip-flop isn't changing at the moment, so there's nothing to update. Bottom line, the Q won't change as long as the clock remains at one. Now, when the clock changes to zero, the leftmost latch will now accept new input. It'll immediately grab whatever values on D, and as long as the clock is zero, the latch will change whenever D changes, meaning it'll grab any transient values from whatever D is hooked up to. The rightmost latch, on the other hand, is now blocking its input. That means it does not change. It won't take on any of the left latch's updated values, transient or otherwise. Thus, Q still doesn't change. The change happens only when the clock rises from zero to one. As I discuss in more detail in a minute, we set the clock's period so that the final value of D is ready when the clock changes from zero to one. That means at this point, D should not have a transient value on it. So with that in mind, let's see what happens when the clock rises. So again, the leftmost latch blocks its input. But since it had been updating D while the clock was zero, it should now be holding the value that was on D just before the clock changed. The rightmost latch is the one now accepting new values. That means it's going to take on the value of the left latch, which is the value that was on D right before the clock changed. It's at this point that Q changes. But since the leftmost latch is now blocking the input, Q won't change again until the next time the clock rises from zero to one. This particular flip-flop is called a rising edge flip-flop because it only changes when the clock rises from zero to one. We can also build a falling edge flip-flop that will only change when the clock falls from one to zero. In either case, we must make the clock period long enough that the flip-flop's input is guaranteed to have its final value before the flip-flop's triggered. So let's see how we can use this flip-flop in a real circuit. So here I have added this master-slave setup to the feedback loop we've been looking at over the past couple of videos. You can see here the D-latch on the left and the D-latch on the right. Now the adder has a propagation delay of about 345, so I have set the clock for a cycle time of 400, so enough for the entire propagation delay of the adder, plus a few more gate delays to allow the latches to change. The one difference to note here is this is a falling edge triggered flip-flop. The not gate is on the rightmost flip-flop, not the leftmost flip-flop. The reason we do that is because with JLS, the clock initially starts at zero and then rises to one. So a full clock period is a zero, then a one. And so at the end of that period, I want the latches to update when the clock falls back down to zero to start the second period. I have the step set here to 100, so let's see what happens. We'll step 100 units of time in, and now that's enough time for the adder to add zero plus five. So we have a final value here already, even though we've built in 345 units of time for the adder. But because the clock's at zero, so this left flip-flop is blocking any input, both the left and the right flip-flops are still showing their initial values of all ones. We step forward to time 200, 
and we can see that the clock has risen to one, but it has just risen to one, so the gates in here haven't had a chance to respond yet. We can just see that the one signal is now in the AND gate. We'll take one more step forward, and we can see that the left flip-flop has accepted the output of the adder, but since the right flip-flop is now blocking the input, it's still stuck on its initial value. We'll step to time 400. We can see that the clock has fallen from one to zero. Clock here is now at zero, but we haven't allowed any time for the flip-flops to react. We'll take one more step forward, and we can see that the rightmost flip-flop is now locked in and sending out the result of that first addition. So now for this next cycle, the adder has a stable five input that it can add. It has already come up with an answer of 10, but because we're in the first half of the cycle, neither flip-flop has saved that yet. So we'll step to the halfway point and one more step, and we can see again that the leftmost flip-flop has taken on the current output of the adder, but the rightmost flip-flop is still holding on to that last value so that the adder can still have a consistent input of five throughout the entire clock cycle. So we come to the falling edge, look forward one, and now that rightmost latch is taken on the updated sum of 10. Now we can step forward a little bit more until the numbers get big enough that we can start seeing some transient values. So here's one. The adder is now adding 30 plus 5, and 100 steps into the addition, it's producing a transient value of 3. But because we're in the first half of the cycle, this left flip-flop is not taking on that transient value. It's not until the clock rises to 1 that it starts bringing in those values from the adder, by which time it has settled into its final answer of 35. Okay, so I'm going to step forward where the numbers are large enough that the adder will need more than half of the cycle time. So we can see a transient value show up in the left-hand latch. So here we can see that we're just past the halfway point so that the latch grabbed that 8189 transient value. You can see there's another one back here. Um, close on its heels. And let me actually bump the step down a little bit so we can watch that a little more closely. We can see some different transient values get picked up by the left-hand latch until it finally locks into the final answer before the clock changes and passes it on as the output of the flip-flop as a whole. And finally, let's look at one last circuit where we're doing the same thing, not with a master-slave setup, but a single register component. So although we looked at a flip-flop as a pair of D-latches, in practice we tend to build flip-flops directly from transistors so they work a little bit faster. And so in JLS, this element right here in the top row is the register element and you can specify how many bits it holds, how many flip-flops are in parallel, and you can choose whether it's positive triggered, negative triggered, or even level triggered. So we can see that register here in place of that master-slave setup, and we can go ahead and step through and see that register count up five at a time. So to wrap up, make sure you can sketch a master-slave style flip-flop, both as a rising edge and a falling edge and be able to explain how it works. In the next video, we'll start using these flip-flops to build sequential circuits.